South Australia is relatively poorly explored lichenologically, and to a large extent, I'd say this is due to there being no local lichenologists working here. So if you consult Pat McCarthy's Australian lichen checklist as a guide, you'll find only 550 odd species listed for South Australia, compared to Tasmania's 1,200 and Queensland's almost 2,000. My aim in this short talk today is to show you what can be found if you really get stuck into a flora and take a good look. Those of you who are familiar with my work would associate me with Tasmania, where I live, and have been working on lichens for about 35 years or so. In fact, when my trickle of papers on Kangaroo Island lichens began to appear, a European colleague remarked, what's going on? Doesn't Tasmania have enough taxonomic problems for you? <laughs> my answer was that indeed it has. And so in 2008, to escape these taxonomic problems and other travails, I went to Kangaroo Island for a holiday to do this. I discovered a fascinating lichen flora, which soon had me doing this and returning to the island almost annually. I've been there seven times now. The lichens of the island had been poorly collected, so I had a fairly clean canvas for my project. My study began with rather casual field work, then came to include a review of every herbarium specimen I could locate, and finally some very targeted exploration of particular habitats and areas. And this map shows you the places I've collected in. At present I've recorded more than 340 taxa, and this slide shows how herbarium specimens and floristic data have accumulated. With lichens, I think it's impossible to ever get a complete list, as there's always a rock or tree you didn't look behind, not to mention the plethora of taxonomic problems that you have to resolve. But I feel that ultimately, 375 to 400 taxa is probably a reasonable guesstimate of the island's lichen species richness. Now I'm conscious that I'm here in Adelaide, so most of you have probably been to Kangaroo Island, but just to set the scene of some of the main habitats that I was looking at, I've got a run of pictures. There was the extensive rugged coastline, which makes for a fascinating littoral zone. And it's made particularly interesting by the juxtaposition of silicious rock types and limestone. There's a lot of mallee on the island, as well as eucalypt-dominated dry sclerophyll forest. There's coastal heathland and melaleuca-dominated swampy woodland. There's bits of coastal colitrous-dominated coniferous woodland, she-oak woodland, and of course one hell of a lot of agricultural land with its mosaic of remnant trees and scattered stones. Most of the common species you see on the island are typical for the relatively dry lowland or maritime areas of southern Australia. For example, Ostroparmelina pruinata is very common, particularly in Mallee. In dry sclerophyll forests and elsewhere, rocks tend to be covered by the green folios Xanthoparmelia species. Limestone tends to be dominated by white crustose Boelia albula and other pale coloured lichens, looking like splotches of paint. And orange and yellow Calaplaca species dominate the littoral zone. However, a, a feature of the flora is that although more than 300 lichen taxa have been recorded, you have to work very hard to find most of them. Some of the more interesting species include Ephebe oscillata, this is an aquatic cosmopolitan species restricted to semi-inundated rocks in fast-flowing fresh water. There's not a lot of this sort of habitat on KI, but it is an Aladdin's cave of species richness. Schismatoma dirinellum. This is the first record of this species outside of the Mediterranean region. It grew on the dry bleached wood of old dead eucalypts, a pretty important habitat with a rather select flora. 
Strangospora pinicula. This is an absolute ripper. Note the scale and you will see how tiny it is. It is widespread in the temperate northern hemisphere, but I found it on Melaleuca in Old Mallee, another first southern hemisphere record. Senegonium pyrophthalmum. This is a widespread southern hemisphere rainforest species. I found it in remnant Calitris woodland. Panaria obscura. This is not really rare on the island, but it is one of rather few cyanobacterium containing species there. It tends to be an indicator of moister, undisturbed microhabitats and therefore of a site worth that extra look. Tropelia teliana. I described this from southwestern Western Australia recently and was delighted to discover it on KI last year. It's not the only KI lichen with this distribution pattern and I gather there are similar, similar WA KI floristic connections in the flowering plants. And lastly we have a KI endemic, this Soroglina halmaturina from Moist Mallee, beautifully illustrated by my friend Pat McCarthy. Now the purpose of this romp through the lichen flora has been mainly to give you an idea of scale and the sort of habitats lichens occur in and where I have to look. With its small population, relative isolation and having one quarter of its land area in nature reserves, it's indisputable that Kangaroo Island has retained a significant element of its natural environment. At the same time, the island has been hugely modified by man. Land clearing has been extensive. There are a lot of nature reserves, but they are concentrated in the west and south and are akin to having all your conservation eggs in one basket. As a result, woodlands which are the repository of so much of the lichen flora have been severely fragmented and continue to degrade. For example, in Mali, Mali when occurring in continuous stands with old dominant trees and a diverse understory is incredibly rich. Standing dead dry trees, the moist basal stockings of living trees, and all the understory shrubs are potentially well colonised. Sadly, in too many places, Mali has been reduced to narrow avenues where wind throwers caused canopy collapse, increased wind and sunlight have dried things out, and browsing by stock impedes regeneration. Another example is Melaleuca swampy woodland, which is perhaps the closest vegetation type to a wet forest on the island and one where an exceptional lichen flora might have been expected. Whilst many stands may look okay from a distance, on close inspection they usually look like this. Broken, disturbed canopies, wheat choked understories, wind throw is common and epiphytes are rare or absent. The same can be said of coniferous woodlands, which consist of tiny fragmented stands that are collapsing. I made some re remarkable discoveries in these woodlands of what are generally called old forest indicators. These are mostly small crusto species with worldwide distributions in temperate oceanic woodlands. On KI they are represented by minute thalli hidden in cracks in the bark of decrepit trees where their long term survival is unlikely. Fire is a recurring phenomenon on KI, but on KI I feel it is potentially very severe in the absence of natural boundaries such as large rivers or mountains. In 2007 a particularly severe blaze destroyed about 20% of the island and in particular its reserved areas. The fire was clearly very hot and after more than six years I could not find so much as a cladonia squamule in much of that burnt landscape. Recovery, if and when it happens, will be very slow. The result is that some species recorded for the island in earlier times seem to be no longer present there or are exceedingly rare. 
and that rocks, isolated trees and small wooded copses provide important but highly fragile lichen refugia in otherwise severely modified landscapes. One species in particular serves as a good case study as it is very conspicuous and hence easy to search for. This is Pseudocyphalaria aurata, a cosmopolitan lichen of moist closed woodlands first recorded for KI in the 1970s. We must have searched dozens of sites for this species and found just one population of a few thalli on about six precariously leaning older mallee stems. This species is in serious trouble. So is Kangaroo Island special? This is a tricky question and it depends very much on your perspective. Coming from Tasmania, the features that strike me are the island's low relief, with the highest point just 300 metres above sea level. No place is more than 25 kilometres from the coast. It is also a very dry place, with most of the island having an average rainfall of only 500 to 700 millimetres per year. All these factors lead to relatively low habitat diversity at least to a Tasmanian, and low habitat diversity usually translates into low lichen species richness. But here's the scorecard. 340 taxa and counting. You'll note that the, or some of you may note that the numbers are an increase on what was given in my abstract, but needing to submit a talk meant that I worked up the data a little bit more. <laughs> 16 new species discovered and described based on kangaroo island types and more in the pipeline. Eight of these are known only from the island, although I'm sure that in time most of them will be found elsewhere. With lichens, endemism does tend to be uh, strongly influenced by collecting effort. 102 new records for South Australia. And these include 16 that are actually new records for Australia, and most of these are new to the Southern Hemisphere. My study on Kangaroo Island has been a pleasant distraction and a great challenge, especially having to learn a new flora, deal with inherently difficult genera, and interpret an ecology that is new to me. But it has also helped me to better understand Tasmania's flora and place it into a broader context. It's also provided the impetus for me to describe quite a few species that I've had in the pipeline for some time, but not had the time to work up and publish. I still take my fishing rod when I go, but my hammer and chisel get at least as much use, and I hope to complete and publish an annotated checklist late this year. Thank you all for listening and thank you to Michelle and the organisers for giving me the opportunity to participate here. <laughs>